In the information age, those gifted in the art of pattern recognition have formidable resources at their disposal, if they choose to take the plunge. The pattern spotter can sift through vast swaths of data and notice trends that most will miss. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you should give the pattern spotter the benefit of the doubt, but you should probably at least listen to them more often than not. Charles Fort was one of the pioneers of schizo-level pattern recognition. Over a century ago, Fort began scouring newspapers, scientific articles, and other accounts for anomalous or otherworldly phenomena. With a witty skepticism, Fort documented thousands of events, from animals falling from the sky in huge numbers to out-of-place artifacts or OO parts that call into question the current accepted timeline of history. Fort was also one of the first to explore the idea of alien abduction, and he was among the first to describe certain phenomena like ball lightning and spontaneous human combustion. Fort claimed that he only actually published a very small fraction of the sheer number of anomalous events that he had collected and cataloged over the years. He insinuated that due to the similar degree and sheer quantity of these strange events across time and space, that humanity was likely owned in the sense that the true nature of our reality was somehow obscured. Owned by who? We are left to ponder and wonder. Fort suggested that a super sargasso sea might exist beyond our own realm that could explain many of the bizarre phenomena he spent a lifetime studying. Now, at the dawn of the 21st century, we've been waking up in record numbers, and finally we're more equipped to understand that we've been lied to about pretty much everything since, well, the beginning. For example, where did the moon come from? The giant impact hypothesis is currently the accepted model, but to say this is sufficient is laughable at best. The Wikipedia page for the moon's origin seems to change fairly frequently, and it currently admits there is no self-consistent model that starts with the giant impact event and follows the evolution of the debris into a single moon. The entire scenario defies the imagination if you really think about it. Many experts have expressed their incredulity. Is our understanding of something as fundamental as the theory of gravity woefully inadequate or completely erroneous? The American inventor Thomas Townsend Brown believed gravity was a push, not a pull, a conclusion similar to NASA astronomer Tom Van Flandern. Brown believed there was a fundamental connection between electricity and gravity, and this relationship could be engineered on a local level. This was a time of heightened interest in these forms of exotic propulsion, and many researchers have suggested that the obfuscation and various theories surrounding the early NASA programs weren't so much about them being entirely faked from the ground up as they were hiding classified technology. What if the moon landing wasn't fake completely, but they hid how they actually got there? What if there isn't where we think it is at all? One theory is that the moon was placed there on purpose by us to make our planet more habitable. Humans from the future. A theory that's starting to make its way into popular culture. And what about flat earth? Universally mocked as a meme by normies, this concept is hotly contentious even among conspiracy circles, often considered to be a red herring meant to poison the well. But the pattern spotter will start to notice something. When concealing a profound truth, two cover stories are often propagated, one for normies and one for conspiracy theorists. There may be variations in each category, and both narratives often contain kernels of truth, but the Hegelian dialectic is clearly at play. Is this part of humanity's awakening process, as the thesis and the antithesis, the normies and the conspiracy theorists, combine their narratives to create the synthesis? If the globe Earth is the thesis and flat Earth is the antithesis, what's the synthesis? Here's an earlier permutation of this divide and conquer strategy. For normies, the Roswell incident was a weather balloon or top secret satellite program, depending on the debunking du jour. For many conspiracy theorists, it was an alien craft with retrieved extraterrestrial bodies. The real story is probably somewhere in the middle. Post-World War II German anti-gravity tech crashed onto American soil, resulting in a justifiable national emergency. Two narratives were hatched as some officials insinuated an otherworldly explanation, and others maintained the mundane. A good deal of wide-eyed speculation surrounds Operation High Jump. What was happening in Antarctica? What was the Cold War really about? Why did America rush to the moon in essentially a tin can, and yet today we have a hard time getting off the ground? The moon is the biggest anomaly of them all, because it's staring directly at us, declaring its utterly improbable inconsistencies for anyone choosing to face them with an open mind. Why does it fit so perfectly in an eclipse? Normies often dismiss this as a happy coincidence, but the pattern spotter has learned to disregard coincidence as a rule. Asimov is quoted as saying, There is no astronomical reason why the moon and the sun should fit so well. It is the sheerest of coincidences. 
the pattern spotter has learned to shun coincidence. He abhors the sheerest of coincidence as a matter of duty. Asimov continues, we cannot help but come to the conclusion that the moon ought not to be there. The fact that it is is one of those strokes of luck almost too good to accept. Then why, dear Isaac, should we accept it? If there currently isn't a good explanation for the moon's origin, and many great minds are baffled at its even existence, the pattern spotter must at least consider the possibility that it might not exist at all, at least in its currently accepted form. Since scientists today have fallen victim to the often inescapable allure of consensus reality, and since the existence of a solid moon was allegedly confirmed in 1969, it's unlikely anyone in authority will ask the obvious. However, there wasn't always this consensus. What is your theory? Well, uh, it is by now rather more than a theory. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I stated to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is uh, plasma plasma phenomena, cosmic plasma, uh, and that this fact will eventually be confirmed. I made certain predictions which were already confirmed in 1958, and the situation now is coming close to a complete confirmation. Is the moon some sort of plasma? Is it a projection on plasma? What are the so-called lunar waves being spotted by amateur astronomers? Why is it difficult to find discussion or even footage of these clear anomalies? Charles Ford would have a field day with lunar waves. Watch. What the hell? I just saw a wave. Good luck finding a similar compilation of lunar waves anywhere else online. For the ones who notice, this is an incredible time to be alive. The amount of predictive programming and soft disclosure in entertainment, advertising, and beyond has become deafening. 9-11 was a litmus test for many. While the normies were content with jet fuel and the conspiracy theorists were babbling about thermite, the most obvious question of them all was conveniently and completely overlooked. Where did the towers go? Like so many stage events, the narratives were put into play immediately. While Harley Guy somehow knew the details of the tower's destruction live on scene, disinfo agents like Stephen Jones were tasked with promoting alternative theories like nanothermite. Jones was previously involved in the effort to discredit the cold fusion research of Pons and Fleischmann, details of which can be found in the documentary Heavy Watergate. The pattern spotter can see there's something more to the destruction on 9-11, and thermite and even mini-nukes are insufficient to explain the footage. 
would cause hundreds of cars to be literally toasted, often in inconsistent patterns. Why do leaves and paper seem to be largely unaffected by the extreme heat required to cause this damage? Is there a connection between this effect and some of the anomalous fires in California and elsewhere? What happened with Hurricane Aaron on 9-11? What is the Hutchison effect? What's the explanation for the otherworldly events during some hurricanes? Was exotic tech used on 9-11? These are questions which will have to be explored another time. If they're lying to us about the moon and gravity and 9-11 and even viruses, why do you believe them when they tell you you're on a little ball hurtling through space? The burden of proof is on them, and their track record is already beyond abysmal. Why are so many images from space straight CGI? Why is there no picture of Antarctica in its entirety? Why did Admiral Richard Byrd say, I'd like to see that land beyond the pole? That area beyond the pole is the center of the great unknown. Why did Byrd warn about invasion by hostile planes coming from the polar regions? What actually happened during Operation High Jump? This footage of Admiral Byrd speaks for itself. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this Earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. Well, this is a tremendous So job. there's a lot of adventure left down at the bottom of the world. Some claim Bird entered an opening into Agartha, or the inner Earth. The idea that Earth is a hollow sphere has been explored many times before, as well as our hollow moon, which allegedly rang like a bell when struck. But the Admiral's words may offend the debunker. He says that there is a great unexplored land beyond the poles. The sheer enormity of the secret, if true, cannot be overstated. If there are realms beyond the poles, it is the single greatest cover-up in the history of mankind. It is a pernicious secret, one that cuts to the very hearts of our psyche. Are we cut off by the vacuum of space, isolated in an unimaginable, immense, unforgiving universe? Or are we connected by a vast plane to other worlds, where such notions of exploration are no longer relegated to the realm of imagination? The repercussions of such a revelation would be paradigm shifting, to say the very least. We are kept under control under the false meaning of scarcity. In a bigger world, this control mechanism is dealt a fatal blow. Are we in a closed system, or is it an open one? A century ago, while Fort was collecting his anomalies and speculating about walking to the planets and oceans beyond our own, a young Italian man named F. Amadeo Giannini was struck with a profound vision. In a moment of divine clarity, Giannini experienced a glimpse of what he believed to be the true nature of the universe. By the late twenties, Giannini had further fleshed out his theory and had attracted some attention with his provocative declaration, even among some academic circles. By the 1950s, the expeditions of Admiral Byrd and others seemed to confirm aspects of his hypothesis, and in 59, he published Worlds Beyond the Poles. Although freely available online, I was actually able to get my hands on an original printing, which now has a new home in my library of esoterica. Although his prose can be meandering and redundant, the theory itself is breathtaking in its audacity and yet simplicity. According to Giannini, there is no end to the Earth at either pole, and instead the land extends out for an indeterminate distance. In addition, there are no isolated globular bodies located in space. The isolated appearance of stars and planets are due to an optical illusion. And in fact, we are looking at other worlds similar to our own, connected and not separated by outer space. This optical illusion results from the function of the human eye lens and all photographic and telescopic lenses, which are patterned after the optic lens. The globular bodies found throughout the entire universe are elements of lens deception. These globular bodies are an illusion. Giannini concludes, beyond the barrier will be found a warmer climate with land and waterways, and it is there that celestial cousins await terrestrial man's arrival, and if one asks how far beyond, it will suffice to record that the distance is negligible with modern transportation speed. To the angels, the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, come down to earth and alter man's history via breeding with the local hominids? How is this even physically possible if they came from an entirely different environment trillions of miles away? Or were they able to reproduce with us because we actually come from the same biological system. 
Giannini maintained that high-altitude photographs of our Earth confirmed this theory by producing similar globular effect when looking down at our land. This radically different cosmological model seems to have been mostly forgotten by the 1960s, along with the publicly acknowledged anti-gravity research programs. The world was placated with the moon landing in 69, had mostly moved on to fight the shiny distractions of the culture war, and the rest was history. But not for the pattern spotter. Worlds Beyond the Poles serves as an important marker, along with the works of Charles Fort, that something was amiss with the official narrative, and it would only be a matter of time before critical mass is reached and the public starts to ask certain uncomfortable questions in earnest and in unison. Why the explosion of interest in flat earth theories when so many people should apparently know better? Why the demonization of any thought or suggestion that isn't sanctioned by Wikipedia and the narrative clutchers? Why do the UN and other organizations insist on using what can only be described as questionably flat earth suggestive symbolism? Why is there so little attention on the possibility that we may be on a bigger earth instead? Why do so many ancient cultures have similar models of our realm? With this introduction, it's time to engage in a thought experiment. Suppose our world is surrounded by some form of plasma. If a light source was shining on us, you would expect to see a reflection in this plasma. Is the moon a reflection of us? Is that why it seems like it shouldn't be there at all? If it's a reflection, can we discern any recognizable patterns on its surface? Or is it difficult to see our world's features because it's far bigger than we thought? Are we a tiny pond on a bigger object? Is each crater a unique biome connected by harsh and often impenetrable lands? Is this our true moon? Instead of flying to the moon, did we leave our crater and land outside? If we're in a crater on a bigger Earth, which part of the moon are we being reflected on? If the moon is a reflection of us on some sort of plasma, what are the planets, the stars? galaxies? Are they other lands, or are they reflections of other lands? A researcher by the name of Wim, who runs the channel God Give Lamste, has done considerable research into the bigger Earth theory. According to Wim, the sun is creating a reflection of ourselves as the moon on plasma. In one model, a black sun is the source of this energy, and the white sun we see is a reflection of the black light on the plasma. Similarly, this reflection effect creates layers of planets, stars, and galaxies. It is quite literally, as above, so below. Did the ancient world know far more than we give them credit? If the moon is our realm zoomed out, could the stars be our realm zoomed in and superimposed as layers of the reflection? Were the ancients giving us more than a clear message? Were they spelling it out for us? By recreating the stars on the terrestrial, were they imparting to us a profound truth through the mists of time? Are there similar patterns in the stars as craters and features on the moon? Wim has found a few already, but if there are more, they are waiting to be discovered by an army of weaponized autists, should they ever be put to the task. Is space fake and gay? Giannini believed there exists a true deep space at the center of it all, from which our realm originated. But there is certainly no outer space filled with globular bodies. Are the stars reflections of different craters and other features of our bigger realm? If so, should we not be reflected as the brightest star in the sky? That honor belongs to Sirius, the dog star. The pattern seeker should recall the Sirius mystery and how the Dogon tribe in Africa claims to have been visited in the distant past by beings who taught them knowledge of the Sirius star system, including the existence of Sirius B, which shouldn't have been known to the primitive tribe. While Robert Temple and others believe this is evidence that these visitors hailed from Sirius, could it be that these creatures were telling the tribe where we are currently located on the star map of our bigger realm? As they pointed to Sirius, they weren't saying, we come from there, they were saying, you are here. Wim's research has led him to conclude that our small Earth is indeed reflected as Sirius in the night sky. What about the moon? Where is our small Earth located? Wim used our 12 hour day and night to narrow down the location. That is the axis on which the craters are moving from dark to light. Only on this axis you have craters with the day and night of 12 hours. Eventually Wim was drawn to the Sulpicius Gallus crater system. Gaius Sulpicius Gallus was a Roman general who also was interested in astronomy, predicting a lunar eclipse in the year 168 BC. In addition to his formidable proboscis, Gallus' legacy also includes being named after several craters on the moon. Our focus will be on the crater known as Sulpicius Gallus M. Does this rather unassuming feature contain a profound secret within? Is this serious? 
Is this us? Is that Series B next to us? Note the prominent V-shaped feature. Does this shape look familiar? Have you seen it before? Have they been giving us a clue about our true world with their imagery? Even the Egyptian symbol for Sirius is somewhat reminiscent of Sulpicius Gallus M. Have they known all along? Is this one of the biggest secrets of all time? Did the Nazis hide out in Antarctica after World War II? Or did they leave our crater and go beyond? Why did Admiral Byrd warn of aircraft coming from the poles? Was he insinuating they would originate from colonized lands beyond the poles? How long have we been colonizing these regions? Much has been speculated about a so-called breakaway civilization that currently exists adjacent to our own with its own autonomous financial and ideological system of governance. It's been suggested that this civilization physically resides somewhere in space, but is it more feasible for them to be right next door? What was World War II really about? And why were the Nazis obsessed with the occult and mythical lands like Hyperborea? Wimp's comparison between images of Sirius and Sulpicius Gallus M are more compelling than you might think, particularly the small notches on either side. He also found that it could very well fit the location on the sky map where Sirius is located. The Seagull Nebula is also a pretty good fit. Using Sulpicius Gallus M and Sirius as a home base, Wim has offered possibilities for the identities of nearby star systems like Betelgeuse, the Crab Nebula, the Pleiades, and Procyon. Note the prominent crater in this Apollo 11 image. In this map, you can see various landing sites on the moon. Note that the original Apollo flights were centered around Sulpicius Gallus M, which would make sense if the first forays outside didn't venture too far from home. The pattern spotter finds these maps particularly intriguing. It would certainly explain the extreme amounts of obfuscation surrounding the missions to the moon. It would explain why the astronauts never dealt with the dangerous radiation they would certainly face on their alleged journey. It would explain why trajectories of rockets show them heading out, not up, and why they still claim they went to the moon. If we accept that the moon is actually a reflection of a bigger Earth, landing outside our crater would indeed be, at least semantically, landing on the moon. If the planets are reflections of nearby craters, which crater corresponds with which planet in our solar system? According to Wynn, the crater Joy is Jupiter in the night sky. A feature in the crater could produce the so-called spot. It just so happens that another name for Jupiter is Jove, from which we get the word jovial, which literally means being filled with joy. In this model, the crater Banting is Neptune with its moons nearby. Linnae A would be Uranus, surrounded by its six largest moons. Wynn believes he also may have located Pluto and even the Kuiper Belt. Archimedes L would be Venus, Archimedes N would be Mercury, and Mars would be Hadley C, located next to the asteroid belt, which may be a nearby prominent mountain range. The distance between crater Earth and crater Mars would be about 1 million kilometers, a daunting length, no doubt, but certainly not quite as daunting as the 225 million kilometers allegedly between Earth and Mars in space. Wim, clearly a next level noticer, spotted a similarity between Mars and a certain feature in England called Silbury Hill, the tallest prehistoric man-made mound in Europe. As above, so below, no doubt. What did the ancients know? If Silbury Hill is Mars, is nearby Stonehenge Earth, Sirius, Sulpicius Gallus M, is that Orion and Taurus and the Pleiades nearby? And what about Saturn? Which crater is that? Linnae seems to fit. And curiously enough, Linnae has generated controversy before for allegedly changing its appearance. This ought to rub the pattern spotter the wrong way. Linnae also boasts a curious triple-ringed feature. Didn't Atlantis famously consist of three rings before it was flooded? The outer layer of Linnae could project a ring in space like those observed around Saturn. Many have waxed eloquently on the Saturnalian cult that has wielded power and influence through the ages. Did they originate from Atlantis? Is Saturn Atlantis, aka Crater Linnae? Did Crater Linnae get flooded? Did the survivors have to cross vast distances on the bigger Earth in search of a new home? Did they settle on a small, unassuming crater called Sulpicius Gauss M that happened to be on higher ground and above the worst of the flood, which was presumably sweeping the greater realm? What do the ancients tell us about giants and heroes and floods and distant lands and gods that came and instructed us with their more advanced ways? Is our crater periodically inundated with a flood from the bigger Earth? Is this the Super Sargasso Sea as postulated by Fort? Are the bizarre falls of animals like fish and frogs due to their arrival from beyond our immediate realm? 
Does this explain why some animals seem to appear in history without any evolutionary developmental antecedent? Did the survivors of the floods of yore seek refuge on high ground, or perhaps outside our crater on Antarctica? Noah's Ark supposedly landed in the mountains of Ararat, but it wasn't until the Middle Ages that a current area in Turkey was thought to be this location. Was it originally somewhere else? Plato noted that Atlantis existed beyond the pillars of Hercules. This is generally believed to be located at the Strait of Gibraltar, connecting the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. But, like Ararat, were the pillars originally referencing a different location, perhaps outside our crater? Sailors used to be warned, non plus ultra, nothing further beyond. Were the tales of monsters and falling off the edge of the earth planted to keep mankind ignorant of the true unlimited nature of his world? A confined man is a controlled man on prison earth. Do certain fictional stories have profound psychological and mimetic impact on society because they give us hints about cosmic truths and these resonate even with the uninitiated? Why are stories of ancient worldwide floods so consistent across so many different cultures? Who were the gods and where did they come from? As it happens, the Hercules Inlet is the name for one of the common starting points for long distance expeditions to the South Pole. The pattern spotter now tries to discern any familiar features within Sulpicius Gauss M itself. Armed with a detailed map of Antarctica, one of the more striking pieces of evidence for this theory becomes apparent. With a 3D model of Sulpicius Gallus M, Wim took the map of Antarctica, rotated it, and then skewed it slightly, which may compensate for it being on a slope, and lo and behold, it appears to fit on the entire right side of the crater. In this model, the left side of Earth is surrounded by an ice wall, and Antarctica is hiding the only practical way out. The Pillars of Hercules at the Hercules Inlet marks the exit to Atlantis and the Great Beyond. Antarctica would be largely unaffected by floods from the Super Sargasso Sea, but the continents would undoubtedly be inundated by the deluge. Even if this fit remains unconvincing, the pattern spotter's interest should be thoroughly piqued by the possibility. Wim has suggested several different models for the actual orientation of the continents on the left side of the crater, but further confirmation would likely require higher quality footage of this region. Why are we told to follow the Yellow Brick Road to Oz? Where and what is Oz? Who lives there? How do we get there? Many old maps appear to show our crater complete with the exit on the bottom. Did our crater used to be fully colonized and populated by mankind? Did massive changes cause Antarctica to become uninhabitable, prompting a migration to the left side of the crater? Is Antarctica hiding an entire lost chapter of human history? Why do some maps show a different orientation for the Americas? This one's from the film Snowpiercer. Why does this seem to resemble the more accurate world map revealed in 2021? Why did the U.S. import thousands of German scientists post-World War II in Operation Paperclip, including the infamous Werner von Braun? Who was Walt Disney really? What did he know? What was his role? Why does the tombstone of von Braun reference the firmament, an allegedly discredited cosmological theory associated with religious fundamentalists and flat-earth wackos? Did the ancients think we lived in a crater too? And what about... Disney theme parks across the globe, are they a message from the breakaway civilization? Are they a soft disclosure of our true realm? Here's so-called Walt outlining his plans for Disney World. For Wim, this is a blueprint for the regions immediately outside our crater. The entire region would be about 10 times the length of our own realm. Wim refers to these segments as the names from Disney World. Epcot, the industrial park area, the entrance complex, and the airport of the future. Is this where celebrities go when they fake their death? Do they leave our world for the breakaway civilization? Here's Ray Bradbury with a curiously similar schematic. What are the ancient myths telling us? What are the common themes and motifs in modern science fiction? What are they showing us in the entertainment indoctrination industry? If we need to go out and not up to experience the universe, then it stands to reason that if you go up enough, 
you'll leave the crater and the bigger Earth will become visible. Is there any footage that might show our lands beyond our own? According to Wim, anonymous source told him to watch the 1996 STS-75 NASA Space Shuttle mission, footage of which is publicly available. Is this the bigger Earth? Is this our crater reflected on the moon as Sulpicius Gallus M and in the sky as Sirius? What about mission STS-94 from the following year? Has the pattern spotter gone too far, pushing the very limits of credulity? Is grappling with the infinite more tolerable when you attempt to bring it just a little bit closer to home? Is it foolish to entertain absurd and improbable theories like Crater Earth when faced with such pressing issues in today's tumultuous landscape? Perhaps. But the pattern spotter is obliged to follow the patterns wherever they may lead. And it's getting harder not to notice that a major shift is currently underway. A lot of the old tricks are losing their effect. The spell is waning. The old guard is more open. Flat versus round, black versus white, man versus woman, right versus left, rich versus poor. These are manufactured dramas meant to obscure the true, profound, and brilliant nature of our reality. Even if every single bit of information presented here can be relegated to the dustbin of lunacy, at the very least, hopefully this will stimulate an imagination or two out there that needed it at this point in time. If there truly is more to this realm than what we've been taught, it's unlikely that humanity as a whole will be developmentally mature enough to handle the implications of such a massive paradigm shift. We must first address the corruption at home before turning our sights outward. It would be wise to depose those in power who continue to keep mankind in the dark about our true history and the nature of our reality, as well as our rightful place in this universe, which we will ultimately attain. Perhaps it's not by chance that the same global leaders who are keen to lock down the world on a whim and who are screaming about lack of resources are also the same ones who may be holding the keys to the bigger realm. If there is a bigger realm, they definitely know about it and they don't want us to know, just yet at least. Because once we do, it spells the end of their ill-gotten gains and reign. For a much deeper dive into the Crater Earth theory, be sure to check out Wynn's channel, which you should be able to locate by searching for Crater Earth. Also check out the research of John Levy, who has also investigated this theory. Did Charles Fort know all along? Someday these questions will sound absurd. They'll be so obvious.